Hi, everybody. This is Sidia, Siobhan, Tamia, and hey. joining us today is Crystal. And we're here today talking about feederism. Is it a fetish or is it a lifestyle? And with us, we have Dr. John Wayne Wilson, PhD, an owner of Completely Psyched website, who has graciously uh, acquiesced to come on board and give us some real insight into this whole concept of theaterism. We talked about it in one of our previous shows where we had read an article about a young woman who weighed 600 pounds and her desire was to gain uh, enough weight to get to a thousand pounds, which for us, that was like, wow. And we didn't quite know how to take that. You know, is that, is that a joke? Is it serious? If it's serious, my God, you know, that's, that's horrible. Is it, isn't it? And so we've been doing a little bit of research and we've been talking to a lot of folks. So um, welcome, Dr. John. Help us to understand what this is all about. Um, you know, the first question out of the box, of course, is, is it, is feederism uh, a lifestyle or is this a fetish? Well, hello, everybody. The first place to start off is to understand that there's not much research on this area and it's only kind of been around in terms of conversation in the past decade or so. And there's a lot of subjectivity involved in the conversation and, and, and some of the stuff I came across on, on, the, on the web. And so, like, is it a lifestyle or is it a, um, a fetish? Well, um, it's probably both. It probably depends on the person. It's a very subjective experience. And so um, it, I, there's a component of it that is a fetish. And basically, a fetish is anything like an object, a body part that is required or necessary for sexual gratification. Now, one person's level of satisf satisfaction uh, may be something different to somebody else. So that's why it's subjective and it's kind of hard to, to kind of pin down. Um, a lifestyle, I, I guess it's, it could be a lifestyle if you look at it in terms of culture and some of like expectations, behaviors, and things like that. Um, now, I, know I came across some stuff that kind of talked about whether uh, it was uh, a, a synonymous with uh, gave, like uh, living a gay lifestyle and things like that. And I'm like, from my perspective, being gay or straight is not a lifestyle. It's, it's how you're born. And so you can behave in particular ways. Now, this I'm not seeing as kind of being necessarily a genetic thing. Um, but then again, there's not a lot of information out there and there hasn't been a lot of focus on this. And so there's still a lot of research. Right now, it just seems like it be a lot of subjectivity and, and opinions. So. Dr. John, I have a question for you. Um, first, I'd like to know um, what are your credentials and what, um, how can people get in touch with you and what your website is if you want them to uh, reach out to you that way. Can you give us that information, please? Okay. Um, I have a doctor from University of Miami. I've been degreed since 1994. Uh, I've been doing therapy since probably started back in late, uh, late 80s. Uh, Recently, I've been in private practice for the past five years, and that's where the completely psyched um, um, name come from. So I can get you can I can be reached by completelypsych.com. Also, by I have a directory profile on the Psychology Today website. If you like, if you're looking for a therapist in the Atlanta area, of Decatur. Would you give me? Would you spell your um, website for me, please? Um, completely psyched. C O M P L E T E L Y site p s y c h e d dot com thank you and i can also be found by that name on facebook and on instagram and twitter and it's uh the full word completely psyched yes they can no find your handles that one okay thank you for that and then i'd like to ask you also um i want to take a moment just to talk about fetish when you said the definition is that when you're you're focused on a particular part um, people tend to say, oh, I have a foot fetish or, oh, I have, um, what are some of the other fetishes? A nose fetish. Right. But when people focus on, they say they're a boob person or a butt person, why isn't that considered a fetish? Because it's the norm. It's a focus on a particular body part. 
Right. The difference is, I mean, yeah, we all have things that we like about a personal about about the people we're attracted to. A fetish for the person to to reach sexual gratification, it's kind of required that that's in place. And so, let's say, I mean, people like sucking toes that that can be a, a, a something that someone like. If it's a fetish, it's like it has to be a part of whatever they're doing for them to be satisfied um, sexually. Where someone who just, I mean, they may like it, but it may not, they may not have to partake in it every time. It may be every once in a while. They can get excited by other things. But a, a fetish is more of a, a kind of a requirement. And so if that is not present, then it's kind of difficult, if not impossible, for the person to be uh, sexually aroused or gratified. And so they, they, so that can lead to then a person becoming obsessed uh, about that particular activity, being involved in their sexual activity or their or their attraction to somebody, and so um, it starts be, it starts uh, entering I think on the the uh, the realm of being extreme because now it's required, and so then some of the normal kinds of um, fluidity that most people have around their sexuality disappears. Okay, that's good definition. Um, I was reading uh, uh, an article about a um, a young a woman who is was seeking a therapist. She herself was not overly overweight. Um, she was, uh, according to this article, both feedy and feeder. Which, just for clarification, uh, the feedy is a person who becomes larger and it feels gratified uh, by gaining the additional weight. And the feeder is normally the partner who uh, assists and becomes, you know, in the fetish world, becomes gratified sexually by assisting this individual to gain weight. But this person had no feedy or feeder. She was both. Um, and she was just obsessed from the time she was young with larger people, even though she was not. And when she would use a vibrator on her body, it just, it was, that was her turn on and trying to, you know, do these um, binges in order to you know, kind of augment her weight. So that kind of a behavior, would that be considered, um, you know, maybe pseudomasochistic? Uh, if you're looking from a health perspective overall, not just with this individual, but with perhaps um, all feeders, feedies, uh, could that be considered maybe there's a suicide wish? I don't know. I'm just asking because if you weigh 600 pounds and you want to be 1,000 pounds, from my perspective, you're asking to die really because you i mean you can't your body can't do that so right and actually they may not be asking to die or even to, to harm themselves mm -hmm. but when for me as a therapist whenever i see behavior i don't care what kind of behavior it is that enters what i would say is kind of extreme or out of the norm then i start asking course okay what are you getting from that like when you when you partake in this what what are you gaining i mean are you so are you receiving attention are you um, becoming relieved of something um, what is it that you're actually gaining? Because that oftentimes is what pulls people into doing things that kind of takes them up, takes them to the 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 outlier uh, side of behavior. And so, um, whether you weigh, you know, 200 and you want to get the 300, or 600 and you want to get the 700, there's something that you're gaining that you know from doing that. And so, now the difficulty is most people are. Um, not willing to kind of look at their behavior in that way to kind of be critical. And so, and then, some, and then the, there's also a, a part of that where it may actually, you may, you know, some people are more oral kind of in, in how, the, where, where their pleasures come from. So that that that's, could be a biological thing. It could be a psychological thing. Yeah. And then the thing with, with food that, that makes it tricky is like we all need food to eat every day. So then, you know, at, at what point right. in your eating or using a food that it becomes like concretely abnormal. And so that can be hard to do. And it is also, it's hard to kind of, you know, 
stop yourself from doing some of these behaviors because of, you know, you're thinking about, I, I can't stop eating. I got to eat. And so, you know, there's a lot of, to me, emotional, psychological reasons as to why people do certain things. And to me, one of the, the biggest motivators behavior is fear. Fear will get us to do all kinds of things, either stop us. Mm. And so as a therapist, I'm going to be wondering, okay, so if you stop eating, what are you afraid is going to happen? Are you afraid that the person that's giving you attention is going to stop? Um, oh. Or are you afraid if you get smaller, something in your life is going to, going to happen that you don't want? I mean, so it, it, the, the variants that come into play are so wide um, that it can be difficult. And so um, now suicide, I'm not, that doesn't seem like that resonates. Okay. Um, but we do things for comfort. We do things to, to avoid pain. We do things to avoid um, being rejected. We do things because we get, you know, that we get attention, whether it's a negative or a positive, we, we get attention. And so those are the kind of questions or those kinds of, of the, the areas in, that you have to go down to kind of explore to kind of really understand why a particular person is doing what they're doing. And so, I mean, we can look at feeding, we can look at uh, bondage. Now, uh, you know, what's extreme? Because some people, I mean, they get a sense of pleasure from um, extreme bondage. But mm, how do you yeah. know that's not tied to some um, um, familiarity with being abused or some childhood issue? I mean, so it, it gets very convoluted. So it's not an easy thing to tease out. And so you need, to, and then also with, with, the, with, with the body and food, shame is, is a major factor. And so, you know, one of the ways in which we, you know, sometimes we, we will battle the, the shame that we feel, we will engage in behavior in defiance. And so if people yeah. shame you about being big yeah. or whatever, well, you will be like, well, forget that. I'm going to be as big as I want. I'm going to love me, yada, yada, and, which, is, which is fine in theory. But then what are the consequences of this? I mean, you, you mentioned earlier about this kind of weight. So we understand that, you know, you weigh a certain amount for a certain amount of time. At, at some point, your body will begin to fail. And so you begin to have health issues, um, higher risk of dying early, heart attacks, and all those kinds of things. So, I mean, one of the things you have to separate out, I think, when you talk about this is feelings and then, and then reality. And so simply because you feel a particular way doesn't mean that's real. That's a feeling that you have. And I understand that we, we operate oftentimes that our feeling is, is real. But sometimes our feelings are wrong. And, you know, and, and sometimes the things that we have to do that's really healthy doesn't feel well, doesn't feel good, but that doesn't mean you don't have to do it. And so um, it gets very difficult. And so one of the ways in which you can kind of combat that, you need, you need people around you to kind of be, one, not shaming, because I don't do shame, and people to be straight with you. And so, but it's so much tied into weight and size in our in our culture it's hard to have those conversations and so dr john when you talk uh, about having people around you who are not into shaming uh i guess being more supportive but right. when we talk about the subject matter feederism and feedies and feeders and is it a fetish is it a lifestyle right uh, oftentimes when you watch the shows like my 600 pound life and those along that line there okay. seems to be people who are um, supporting you, but negatively, they're bringing those individuals the food. Right. Or right. so, how does that? And, well, I, I, and I always wonder, well, you know, what are they gaining out of that? And so exactly. I, you know, I, I actually saw a clip uh, the other day where it's a seven hundred pound woman, and then she, her fiance, he was like probably, I mean, he was normal. I don't know he was average uh, weight. You know, probably 180 pounds. He, I mean, he was bringing her food on it, like like it's a restaurant serving a crowd of people. And so I'm like, what is he getting out of this? And so I'm like, you know, is there an aspect of control in this? Is there an aspect of not wanting her to be, you know, for one, she dependent. couldn't. Be, he couldn't. Yeah, yeah. Dependent. She's not getting out the house. She's not getting around other people. So there's no threat that someone else will will catch her attention. So I began wondering about that because I hear that a lot, you know, uh, with my with my uh, clients um, of of kind of insecurity and 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 sabotaging and and not and them not really recognizing that they're sabotaging their partner. They're mm -hmm. you know they they are coming from the perspective that you know this is what she wants, this is what he wants. They feel better, they like this. I'm I'm here to serve them, but at the end of the day, you're not really serving them. 
um, you, you, you may be setting them, setting them up for something that they may not want to experience once it happens. Also, and Dr. I, John, I was going to say it, to, to that point, um, in some cases, don't you think it's self-serving? Because in the case of a man has a 700 pound wife, you know, um, and he's feeding her and keeping her uh, immobile, you know, so there could be the, the, the positive side, and I'm, and I'm saying positive, okay. um, is that, okay, I love my wife, I'm jealous if somebody looks at her. But on the flip side, my, my side that, you know, tends to be a little cynical says, oh, it's an opportunity for him to be out doing whatever he wants to, and she'll never find out, you know? And so that's his, that's his satisfaction of, of doing it. But there's so many others that um, in the feedy community um, who, as you said earlier, I mean, they seem to just get sexual pleasure, which I don't get, um, out of watching the bodies grow and, right. you know, uh, and, and that just, you know, stuffing them is just a thing. So, right. yeah. How is that? Well, that, you know, that makes well, that makes you know that that's another part of this conversation is difficult because not everybody who is into uh, being a feedy or a gainer is extremely overweight. They may be slightly overweight, and so some people mm-hmm. have a preference for individuals who are slightly overweight for a whole host of reasons. And so, but I know mm-hmm. I did recognize as I was kind of getting prepared for today that much of the video is on really obese people. But in, uh-huh. in, in my readings, it was like, it was um, talk more about not necessarily being, being extremely obese, but, but the idea of being larger. And so then like actually artificially padding their clothes to get that whatever sensation, maybe carrying a more artificial weight around, but whatever that, whatever that does for them, it was, that's what they, that's how they went about it. They didn't gain a ton of weight. They didn't necessarily want to be extremely overweight. Um, and so, I mean, it, we, you know, people have different preferences. Some people like individuals who are thin, some who are plump, some who are chunky or, you know, all these different term, ter- uh, terms that get used. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and not everybody is, not everybody's BMI is in the obese um, realm or higher. You right. know what I mean? And so, um, so I think, you know, when I was, I mean, it, it, I just came across and cut, it's, it's a lot of opinions and a lot of people kind of speaking from their own kind of, I guess, personal experience and talking talking in a way as if this is like, like this has been studied and we have been measuring this and this, we've been talking, and really it's about opinion and, and subjectivity. And so it makes it, I mean, it makes it difficult. Also kind of like I said, you know, mitigating some of the uh, shame or embarrassment. So I think some of, some of this people, you know, like I said, may be kind of entering into this in, in this in this way to kind of uh, be defiant. Like I refuse mm-hmm. to be judged socially by how, you know, by my size. And I get that mm-hmm. from, you know, from an emotional standpoint. And so, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that your behavior is necessarily um, healthy, you know, and also depends on who you're around. Cause I mean, when I look at other types of extreme behaviors, for example, people coming out of the military don't recognize oftentimes that they drink too much because Within the military, people drink a lot, so it seems like it's enough. Then they get out, and the next thing, you know, drinking, you know, twenty-four beers in the military for a week is not a, as extreme. But in civilian life, that's like way overboard. And so that, you know, we normalize um, extreme behavior depending upon, you know, what we like, what we don't want to feel shame about, and what people we're around. And so that can skew the whole conversation. Um, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, what I'm going to look at as a therapist is whatever behavior you're doing, feeding, gaining, whatever, how is it impacting the rest of your life? Is it, is it putting some constraints on the rest of your life? So are you able to, you know, to do the things that you enjoy doing, but, you know, outside the home, in the home? Um, are you able to, you know, feel free of pain and, and things like that? And if you can't, then, you know, you need to be questioning why you're doing what you're doing to that level. And so I'm going to imagine if you weigh 700 pounds, you're probably not going to be able to go for a walk in the park, leave the house often, you know, clean up your house in a way that you probably would want to. I mean, you adapt to it, but 
that's where my concern would come because then you then then other problems start creeping up, you know, beyond health, you know, and so. Um, but you know, Javon, did you want to say something? Oh, I I actually had a question. Um, do you think you know um, when we're addressing the feed, the person being fed? You know how when just us as normal people, regular people without the fetish, um, you know, we get some kind of enjoyment, you know, just eating food. It would it would it be you know how like if you eat like a piece of cake or a piece of something that tastes real good and you're like, mm, it tastes really really good. <laughs> like would it be an extreme level of that kind of gratification? I would say so. Um, I mean, for, I, I remember watching the video and the, as the woman, she was large, she was 700 pounds and she wanted to get to another hundred or something more. And it's like every bite she took of her food, it looked mm -hmm. like she was having like a mini orgasm. God. Yeah. I mean, it was wow. just like, <laughs> egg food like, oh, yeah. oh you know, <laughs> just like that. Yeah. And I'm so, exactly. <laughs> you know, and for, for people who like food, if you, I mean, you eat a meal that you really, I mean, you'll have that, you'll have that experience. Yeah. Now, do you want to have that experience every time you eat with every meal and every bite to where right. that becomes the drive? And then the sensation, because your body is going to tell you, the body, the brain is geared to tell you to stop eating. Right. Chemical, chemicals kick off and say, you're, you're full, you're satiated. And so mm -hmm. for, for that, that, that drive to be so strong to, to, to bypass um, normal, healthy body signals to stop, to me, to me that's, a, that's a problem. Because that, that means yeah. you're going to start entering into something that you may not um, um, want, to, want to go to. So, um, Tamia, did you have a question? I don't have a question, but a comment actually. Um, just a few days ago, I was talking to a friend and um, they had asked if I had cooked. And so of course, normally when I cook, I invite people over sometimes or sometimes I'll just have friends randomly say, hey, did you cook and they wanna come over? And I was telling this person, it gives me a high, but the term I used then in the conversation, I said it turned me on when someone actually enjoys my food or when they ask for more or can I take some home? And the person took it literal to say it turns you on. And then I just thought about it. I'm thinking, okay, not sexually, but it excited me. But the person did initially think, okay, did this sexually turn you on? <laughs> or, and I was just saying, it just, no, but it, just excited me. <laughs> and that's why I was kind of smiling when you were saying about, um, cause I was remembering that situation that, um, about the feeder, the feeder. Now I enjoy to feed people. <laughs> I even feed homeless people. I enjoy cooking. And I, again, like I said, I enjoy a good compliment. And to me, a compliment is asking for seconds and even asking to take some doggy bag home. And that does but give me an excitement. I get a high, but not a sexual <laughs> high. <no. laughs> but well, it does have, give me a high. We have to recognize that food serves more than than uh, more, food has a purpose more than just kind of feeding you. Yes. Um, the food serves a cultural purpose. Food serves a social purpose. You know, and so those things can be stronger than the actual nutrition that you're getting from the food. Because if, if it was just about nutrition, we would stop eating. Mm -hmm. um, way before we oftentimes do, but if it's a, if it's about social gatherings, connection, you know, love. I mean, we all, I'm sure we all have experience. If we eat a piece of food that was that was prepared by somebody we cared for, they're not around anymore. You know, you mm -hmm. eat it, you will think about them. And so, right. food food is a very powerful um, yes. aphrodisiac. It's a very powerful object. And so, you know. Like we said, use it in every <laughs> setting: birth, death, marriage, right. everything. There's food. There's always right. food. centered around food. We come to the kitchen. We sit around the table. But yeah. I think something that was touched on that we kind of walked away from a little bit is the payout. So, you know, T, you kind of mentioned that it makes you feel good that people want to eat. Yes. Okay, there's your payout. We talk about 
you know, eating something and humming. I know if I get Doritos, mm. and I'm eating a family size bag, yeah. family right. size. We ain't talking that little, yeah. little snack bag. I don't know who's that for. I get a okay. workout from eating this this bag of Doritos. So, you know, with feeders and feederism and um, Dr. John, what is it? Codependency. When you see Codependency, people right. who are feeding people and they're depending on them. Oftentimes when people, the, the larger person gets um, stomach, you know, stomach reduction surgery and that sort of thing, that relationship falls apart because right. they no longer need or want that caregiver in that manner. They actually right. want a relationship with that person. And that person feels like you don't need me because you don't need me to bathe you, right. feed you, right. that sort of thing. So I think at the end of the day, and like you said, we eat way beyond our body's notification because there is a payout. Right. There right. is a true payout for for that behavior. And, you, and you're making a good point because in any relationship, we all have a role. We have different roles that we play and, and we play them consistently over time. So whenever your role changes, you have some, it has to be an adaption. And so in, in that feeder feeding um, relationship, the roles are very clear. And so, you you know, you find satisfaction in being able to, you know, to know what to expect, what to do, how to be. And so you just kind of, you double down. I'm good. I'm good with this. I'm, I'm, right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay in this role. So when, when one of those people decide that they, they no longer want to play that role, then yeah, the relationships, ha- it has to be a shift. Yeah. And not everybody's on board for the shift. Right. And not everybody understands why the shift is happening. That's where you, I mean, you hear a couple of about you know, we grew apart. Well, that's or part panic. Of panic sets in. They panic. And some people what do panics, I do now? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depending I gotta on find the next big person to feed. Yeah. Right. Depending on right. Depending on on what they're getting and how invested they are in things remaining the same. So right, people begin to panic. They get they get anxious. They they wonder. Okay, well, if if this changes, then what am I going to do? You know, who am I going to be with? How who am I going to be? be? Right, you know, right. you know Which, what does you it know, say about me? Yeah, it, it, you know, in in any relationship, you right. know, you have that. I mean, for the most part, men want to be the hero, okay, and women we play into that to be my hero. Um, and when all of a sudden you're 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 not doing that any longer, and you you know, especially if you're a very strong individual, you know, strong woman, and you decide I'm no longer want to play damsels in distress so he can feel better you know or you, then, or you, want, or you want to change the role you've been playing you see that, that yeah, whatever yeah. role is not working anymore right, i still yeah. want you to be the hero but you need i want you to be the hero in a different kind of in way. Different way exactly yeah. and, and so yeah. you kind of work that out so huh? you, right. you had mentioned um feederism and fetish as a sexual nature but mm-hmm. dr john a lot of those people are not actually sexually active or physical, could it just be the codependent aspect of it? And it's not, are Phoebe, Phoebe, is that the site city? Phoebe. Are they, Phoebe, mm-hmm. are they stating that it is actually a sexual um, relationship or situation or Dr. John, is it, could it just be the codependency? And there is no sexual content well, context yeah. to it. I'm going to imagine a lot of people that's probably playing a role in it being, you know, uh, that codependency kind of, I feel good because I make you feel good. You feel good. Then I feel good. And so you, what ends up happening, you end up getting lost in, in, in this relationship. And so uh, now sex, you know, I, depending, I guess, depending on how large people be, uh, get, I mean, it's, I, I don't know, you know, I'm trying to envision how that will look in terms of sexual behavior, but I also realize that, um, um, sex doesn't always happen physically. It's also it's emotional and and, and, exactly. and fantasy. Yeah. And so you know, there are people who rarely have physical sex or never have physical, but they still are very sexual. And so it just depends mm-hmm. on how fluid your sexuality is, you know. Right. But codependency, my my sense is codependency probably may have a role with some people. Uh, this need for control for other people. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this uh, certain amount of fears. You know, for and it and it's and it. I mean, we're talking about like they're they're, they're um, discreet. There's probably so much overlap, 
you know, with all these different things that we're talking about, they explain why somebody uh, would would be uh, involved in this uh, uh, in this behavioral lifestyle. Thank you. Okay, so I hear you and I agree with you on that. I think that, yeah, um, I think there's a lot of codependency and you're talking about role plays and the whole nine yards and um, and I need to take that out of my vocabulary, whole nine yards. Uh, that's a whole nother, whole nother topic. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's, really, it's really fascinating, this whole idea. Um, as you've explained it, though, I, I think I can relate a little more to the the um, interaction between what would be considered standard normal relationship behavior uh, with regards to you know roles and how in this particular uh, situation this is how they have found their way um, of relating to one another um, you know and uh, satisfaction being satiated either by eating all the food or watching one grow. Uh, but it apparently seems to be gaining momentum. You know, there's like a groundswell. If you're looking at the Phoebe site, there's more and more people that seem to be joining and wanting to be a part of that. Um, and I have a concern, like I said, you know, health. I will be the first person that to tell you, I'm never gonna tell you you need to be on a diet. What I am gonna say though is you need to take care of yourself and you need to hit, live a healthy lifestyle, all right? You have and been saying that since I've known you over 30 years. You've that said, what, oh, I will yes. never tell you to go on a diet. You've always said I that. I will never will. I will never, yeah. I will never say that mm -hmm. um, because I believe a person has to be satisfied um, and happy about who they are, confident in who they are and what they are and when you force that individual to diet, as you said, Dr. John, earlier, you know, people then do the reverse out of defiance and nothing is gained from that behavior. So um, it's about being healthy and, you know, you can, you can be a big person and still be healthy, all right? Um, and you can step in and there are a lot of different things that you might do or not do um, that can or cannot be detrimental, but the whole idea is, you know, I, you know, I'm in a, I'm a big girl and I like it. I love how I love my body, you know? Um, and I don't want you forcing your will on me. Let me make my choice. If I decide, you know what, I think I'm having a medical issue. And perhaps if I drop a little bit of weight, you know, it'll be better for me. That's my choice. All right. So um, with let me, these people, let me ask Dr. John, um, mm -hmm before we have to wrap up. So yes, do you consider feederism a fetish? And is it a, um, is it negative or is it subjective or? It, it, well, it's subjective and, and literally anything can be a fetish object. I mean, there's no like, there's no, there's no parameters or barriers to say that this, this, this fits into that box and then this doesn't. So part of the, diff, you know, part of the challenge of having, you know, talking about this, this topic or kind of understanding it, mm -hmm. we have to, like, we have to get outside of our comfort zone or our own box to kind of um, um, understand that, that how we're looking at it is probably not as full as it really is. Um, and we mm -hmm. have to recognize that, you know, we may not understand part of it. We may not be comfortable with it, but literally anything could be a fetish. And so, and, and accept that even if we don't see it, doesn't mean it's not. And so, I mean, I can see this easily being a fetish and people really getting into it and being, you know, being happy doing it. But like I said, my concern is, you know, or my questions rather would be, how is this impacting your life overall? Because right. your whole life is not you just eating. And so like, how is it impacting your relationships, your ability mm -hmm. for income, you know, moving around, all those kinds of things. And so, and also, you know, a lot of it to me is kind of, um, unlike other fetishes, 
I think this particular one probably has an overload of shame attached to it that you have to kind of right. sort through, right. you know, because um, I, I will imagine you, if you if you mention some other fetishes, people wouldn't be looking at you sideways. It wouldn't be all this extra stuff. But this, right. you know, it's so much shame that gets attached to body shape, body size, weight, you know, your BMI, what, what is what the uh, scale says that is difficult. You know, and so if you like, like, like City was saying, you know, if you're comfortable with yourself, you almost have to, you just can't, like, you just can't make a comment. You got to be like defined about it. And so mm-hmm. the conversations become conflictual, you know, and it's then it's hard for people to hear, you know, if you have a conversation with someone about their health and you're not, and literally you are not really into, you're not, you're not concerned that they're big or whatever size, you're like, you need to lose weight because, you know, you, you uh, like I had a friend of mine who needed to have a hip replacement and and she was not able to move and she was an extreme amount of pain. And I remember having lunch with her. We were co-workers and I and we were good friends. And I, and I, I mentioned something about, you know, it may be helpful to lose some weight because it would be less weight on your joints. Mm-hmm. Now, did she take it that way? No, <laughs> she thought I was speaking to her size. I'm like, no, I'm not talking about your size. I'm not. I don't care about that. It's like you. Can, I had to break it down to them. You can't walk through the park with your five year old daughter. You, it takes you ten minutes to get out your chair. You're an extreme amount of. That's what I'm talking about. So it's just so much shame and so much right. we're grappling with that makes this, you know, this kind of hard to talk about. Because people inherently will feel like you, you you're talking um, either at them or down to them, or you or you shaming them. You know, and so. Uh, I don't think it'll ever become acceptable. We might, it may become a little bit more mainstream as America right. becomes larger, but I don't think, I mean, because if you say to somebody, oh, I have a foot fetish, they immediately, you know, eyebrows raise, which, but how long have people had foot fetishes? So I think. Right. You know, but you know, but with that, they'll just think you're freaky. Right. They won't right. They right. Just think you're freaky. Yeah, 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 this, yeah. It's, yeah. it's, 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 I, I, I have a foot fetish, but I don't think it's freakish at all because it, it's really it has nothing to do <laughs> with. That's why. Look, that's why my I sexual preferences look, or anything. Saying, that's why I it, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So to me, yeah, to me, sucking on toes is freaky. <laughs> Other no, people well, I'm not on, talking about that. Toes, I mean, yeah, I'm just saying, right. but example. Yeah. And some people, you know, you know, like when I hear certain guys talk about, you know, a woman with a big big behind right. some guys that's like that doesn't that does nothing for them you know or someone with big eyes or someone with the gap teeth i mean it's like it could be anything yeah, anything that's, really that's focused yeah you know and so what's right what's wrong like i i get down to i get down to practical basics how is it impacting your life is it disruptive to your life it's with, like with anything you know right. and so whether you're using you know Marijuana. Well, are you using so much that you don't get up to go to work? I mean, like, is it causing a problem or is it not? Right. You know, are you drinking? Okay. To some degree, yeah, too much is you. You can figure out how too much, but is it, is what you drink, if you drink a glass of wine a night and it makes you unable to function in your family and all, then that's a problem. Somebody else can handle maybe three glasses a night, you know, so it's very subjective, but it's, you know, like I said, we get we get we get protective of what we do. We don't like to see what we're doing as being out of the norm. Right. You know, right. and so we will then justify a lot of behavior. You know, it makes me feel good. It ain't hurt nobody. But you know, you yeah. weigh seven hundred pounds. You weigh eight hundred pounds. You're trying to get bigger. Odds are you're gonna die much younger. And mm-hmm. so you, that impacts a whole host of people from family, friends, and and you know, and if you're working, you know, your employer. So. But no one, we don't want like we don't like to really think about talk about those things when we're doing our behavior. We want to, you know, we want our behavior to be seen as like good, even if all practical information tells us that it's not. Right. Or just that it's our choice and we're grown. And how dare you tell me how? Right. I that's the other thing. Right. Right. Live my so, life. I mean, right. You know. Yeah. So if it's, you put it all in the bag and shake it up. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Which is why I don't tell clients what to do, but I will point out. <laughs> the consequences of your behavior and I won't, mm-hmm. you know, and I won't kind of buy into ignoring dysfunctional stuff. The obvious, stuff that right. may be harmful. So, right. I mean, I'll, I'll bring it up, but you know, you got to live your life. And exactly. so you, you make your choices. And if it's, and if you're clear on it and you, you understand the consequences, then okay. 
but I still will kind of, you know, bring, you know, bring up the consequences and this and that and, and, um, and, and keep you aware of what, you know, what choices you're making and, and where it can lead to. I think that's good information, Dr. John. Um, Cydia, I think on that note, I don't know I'm, that you can I was just, I think the conversation. We, so we haven't quite reached the top of the hour, but I want to thank you for joining us today. It's it's a fascinating subject, and we can probably you know talk on it for quite a while. But I really appreciate your clarifying some things, and it gives me personally a better perspective on how to um, receive it when I see and read about it. And should we ever be able to get someone who is actually living this lifestyle fetish, whatever, um, to come on the show and talk about it, it would be awesome. And we maybe invite you back, you know, that would be great. Okay. And there'll be lots, lots of things going forward, I am sure that we can uh, tap into you as a wonderful resource. I appreciate it. Thank you so very much. And to anyone watching in the Atlanta area, Dr. John Wilson, you're going to want to look him up. Completely psyched. Thank you. Have a great one, everybody. Ruben Smith.